So today I uh, witnessed something interesting um, in my neighborhood uh, on this street, there's a curb, right? And just beyond the curb, grass, water, a little bit of a forest area, right? And as I was walking, I, I saw this little beetle, maybe uh, an inch and a half big, this black beetle, frantically scurrying on the road. You could see it looked as if it was struggling. That's what I sense, struggling as fast as it could. Hot sun is beating down on it. You know, it's black. It's on the black road. It's probably getting roasted. And from what I could into it, it was it wanted to go above the curb and onto the grass into its natural habitat, its natural home. I couldn't talk to the beetle, but that's that's what I saw. That's what I sensed. And I also noticed how it would climb onto the curb and then sort of be parallel with the ground. So it appeared as if it could climb, but then it would quickly come back down, almost as if when it would go from being level to the ground, up on the curb, on, onto the side, parallel, uh, perpendicular to the ground, it would feel afraid, which I can understand, right? It's like if you're all, almost hanging <laughs> perpendicular, it's it's like your whole sense of up and down is totally messed up, right? So anyway, I was just watching this thing scurrying, again, completely exerting itself in a full, full display of fear and struggle. And it would go, and then if it came across something that looked like a barrier, then it would turn around and go in the other direction. And if it came across something else, then it would turn around. So just stuck in this, uh, this black desert of the of the road, even though it was so close, so close to its natural habitat, just just inches away. And then I saw someone come, and um, there was this plastic lid. Uh, that someone had thrown out, probably they were driving by eating some fast food. They just threw out their their uh, cup and now this plastic lid was there. So they put the lid down in front of the, the beetle's path. And just as the beetle stepped over it, they picked it up and kind of fl dropped it, sort of flung the beetle onto the grass. And it was amazing immediately as the beetle touched the grass, right? And this is a grass where it's like tall, dry levels of grass, maybe six, seven inches high. So much bigger than the beetle, right? So it's not like a flat grass where the beetle can run. So the beetle kind of landed on top of one of the blades and then it descended slowly into that thicket of grass. And it was as if immediately when it touched the, it went from this frantic running around, it was running so quickly that when it stepped onto this like raft, right, the, this person had to pick it up very quickly. Otherwise, within a second, it would have been off. Within a microsecond, it would have been off that, that little raft of a plastic lid. But immediately as it touched the ground, it slowed down. The fear was gone. There's a, there was a recognition, I'm home. And there was a descending into the grass, probably shaded by the glass, the grass cooled down home. This is what it's like for us when we get perturbed when we feel fear, anxiety, worry, frustration, anger, lacking, like we're not enough, that like we need more, like we're not safe. We're like that beetle. Just going back and forth, back and forth, exerting ourselves in the mind, thinking, thinking, trying to think our way out of it. And you know, I thought that this Dhamma is like that plastic lid. It's discarded. 
even for those of us who've, who've heard it, most people never see it, right? It's just some something discarded on the grass. But even for those of us who've heard it, we don't use it all the time. When we use it in an instant, we're back home. And as you guys know, we've I've had the real privilege of spending time with Bhante Dhammajiva, the Sri Lankan monk recently, and it's just completely blown away by, by him. But the way he teaches in just a moment of mindfulness, as he says, in just a moment of mindfulness, mindfulness, everything changes. When we bring this awareness, this presence that we already have into the body, if you pay attention, if you appreciate it, we don't appreciate it. We 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 do it very quickly, and we, oh, it's not so not so big a deal. And then we're back to running, running through the past and the future and whatnot. But if you linger there, even for a moment, and appreciate it, you might find that just like that, past is gone, future is gone, planning is gone, lamenting is gone, remorse is gone. If you pay attention, if you allow yourself to fully feel there's a recognition, actually, this is my home. It's not out there through the sense bases. It's not from, remember in the Buddha, in the Buddha Dhamma, there are six senses. There's the five bodily senses, sight, hearing, smelling, tasting, bodily touch. And there's the sixth sense of cognition, thinking, ideas. When we go there, we, we're leaving our home, actually. So just like that beetle, immediately when it touched the, the, the grass, its movements slowed. There's a, there was a recognition, I'm home. This is how close we are to home. It doesn't have to be this long, drown-out thing. You know, we don't have to travel many miles and go on pilgrimage and go to the temple and do all these things. That All that can be fine. But if you have faith, the sadda, if you trust in the Buddha's words, you will start to feel that actually being mindful is enough. As Ajahn Sumedho says, trust in awareness. Awareness is enough. Trust that. That's, that's his version of sadda. And his version of samavayama, right effort, is to is the effort to trust in awareness. So in a moment, you, get, you can get a taste of it, this, this beautiful glimpse, this taste of the Nibbana Dhatu. But the Dhammajiva calls it momentary Nibbana. Tan Ajahn Buddhadasa talked about it as the, the Nibbana Dhatu, the cooling element. It's anytime we're not getting roasted by the defilements of desire, aversion, ignorance. When we're not getting roasted, we taste Nibbana. It might be a little Nibbana, but it's an indication. It's the opening of the gate to the deathless. Ajahn Sumedho says that sati sampanjanya, this open awareness. Um, different teachers talk about it differently, but I like to think of it as an open awareness. He said, he would say it's the 
launching pad to the death list. So what does it mean to take refuge in the Dhamma, the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha? What does it mean to take refuge? Notice what you take refuge in. Where do you go for, for refuge, for safety? We go to the senses. We're not feeling well. We go, we want to eat something. We we pick up our phones, we scroll through social media, we we watch TV, we do all these things in seek in in search of refuge. But there's a better refuge, one that actually works, that is effective, that is free, that is available, that you already have, that you come born with. It's our birthright. As Bhante Dhamma Jiva says, it's we're endowed with this, this capacity for mindfulness. Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh said he called it a miracle, the miracle of mindfulness. Can you feel that? Can you consider that this thing that is so discarded, like that plastic lid, so unassuming, my, this quality of mindfulness, it's it seems like no big deal. But it's a miracle. So just feel it, spread your awareness throughout the whole body. See how your mind feels at home. When you take up residence in the body, everything aligns. The energy of the body comes alive. The mind and the body are two lovers destined to be with one another. When you put them apart, what happens when you separate Romeo and Julia? They want to kill themselves. It's agonizing for two lovers to be apart. It's like two young lovers, completely infatuated. But when you bring the, the body and the mind together, freedom, samadhi, all of it. So now I want to um, bring some of the Buddha's words from the Uttara Sutta, Samyutta Nikaya 2-19. And I got this from a book uh, called Fleeting Moment, written by Bhante Dhammajiva. It's available online. Um, I'll have to remember to uh, provide all the links to this uh, video in the, in the notes. Uh, let me share my screen here. So once, when resident at Jeta's Grove, a celestial being, a devata, so this is like a heavenly being, appeared before the Buddha, stood by the Buddha's side, and uttered the following verse. So this deva's name is Uttara. So he says, Time flies by, the nights swift, the nights swiftly pass, the stages of life successively desert us. Seeing clearly this danger of death, one should do deeds of merit that bring happiness. So again, time flies by, the nights swiftly pass, the stages of life successively desert us. Seeing clearly this danger of death, one should do deeds of merit that bring happiness. 
Having uttered the above verse, the Devata expected some critical evaluation by the Buddha. The Buddha acknowledged the Devata's words as, of course, time does vanish from our midst to never return. This human life is fleeting. It's as if it were an arrow escaping from the bow. That's a beautiful image from Bhante. This human life is fleeting. It's, a, it's as if it was were, were an arrow escaping from the bow. The stages of life desert us so swiftly and death approaches us fast. Yet, instead of stopping short and doing meritorious, uh, stopping short at doing meritorious deeds that bring about happiness, the Buddha calls for a separation from sensual desire to reach a state of peace. So the Buddha responded, and you'll notice that the first three lines are identical to what the Deva said, but the last one is different. So the Buddha says, time flies by, the nights swiftly pass. The stages of life successively desert us. Seeing clearly this danger of death, a seeker of peace should drop the world's bait. A seeker of peace should drop the world's bait. So I'm going to now go on to another sutta. But I think you'll see that it'll sort of build on this last line here, that a seeker of peace should drop the world's bait. So this next sutta is Yavakalapi Sutta. Yavakalapi Sutta, it's Sam Samutta Nikaya 35-207, the sheaf of barley or grain. So the Buddha says, suppose monks that a sheaf of barley were thrown down at a large four-way intersection. And six men were to come along with flails in their hands. They would thrash the sheaf of barley with their six flails. Okay, so I actually got a video of this. Um, in ancient times, right, um, if you were processing barley or wheat or grain, you would use these large, heavy rods or sticks and smack that wheat and that would separate out the the barley or whatever it was from the sort of sticks so and um i'll just quickly show a video of this that i found online so you can see it's sped up here this guy is just hammering the sheaf of barley okay So basically the Buddha is saying, imagine there's this sheaf or this pile of barley thrown down at a large four-way intersection. And I, I saw that the commentaries suggest that the four-way intersection might be the, the sense bases. Anyway, um, six men are going to come along and they would smack that barley with their six rods. And that sheaf of barley would be thoroughly tr thrashed, the six rods. And then a seventh man is going to come along with another rod in his hand, and he would thrash that sheaf of barley with the seventh rod. So that sheaf of barley would be even more thoroughly thrashed with the seventh flail. In the same way, the uh, uninstructed run-of-the-mill person, sometimes it's called the uninstructed commoner or the uninstructed worldling, is thrashed in the eye by charming and pleasurable forms, thrashed in the ear by charming and pleasurable sounds, thrashed in the nose by charming and pleasurable aromas, thrashed in the, in the tongue by charming and pleasurable flavors, thrashed in the body by charming and pleasurable tactile sensations, thrashed in the intellect by charming and pleasurable ideas. And if that uninstructed commoner forms intentions for the sake of further becoming in the future, then he, that fool, that foolish person, is even more thoroughly thrashed, just like the sheaf of barley thrashed with the seventh rod. Okay, so remember the Buddha says, someone who seeks peace should not take should not take the world's bait. 
when the eye sees something pleasurable, it appears like pleasure, right? The eye sees something beautiful. We, we, we desire arises. We feel the sense of pleasure towards it, sometimes subtle, sometimes very intense. That is taking the world's bait. That's actually getting thrashed or hit really hard, like a sheaf, like we're a sheaf of barley getting thrashed by a rod. And this this includes the intellect, the sixth sense base, when we have thoughts or ideas that that we cherish. Even that is taking the world's bait. Okay, now this sutta continues. This gets very interesting. The Buddha says, once monks, the devas and the asuras were arrayed for battle. So devas are, are uh, heavenly beings of a certain caliber or rank, a certain... Uh, level of refinement and pleasure, right? Uh, like in the previous sutta, there was a deva that came. Now, asuras are also sort of like heavenly beings. They're in a in a level that is sort of above the human plane, but they are less, it's a less elevated level of heaven, less refined. Um, there's a story that the asuras are, were sort of kicked out of the higher heavens of the devas, because they uh, indulged in alcohol or this divine drink. But anyway, the, the Buddha is saying once these devas and asuras were getting ready for battle and Vepachitti, I hope I'm saying that right, Vepachitti, the lord of the asuras, told the asuras if in the battle with the devas, the asuras win, then bind Saka, so capture and bind Saka, the lord of the devas. Bind him by his neck, his hands, and his foot, his feet. And bring him before me in the city of the Asuras. And at the same time, Saka, the, the king of the devas, the lord of the devas, addressed the devas of the 33. He said basically the same thing. If the, if the uh, Asuras lose the battle, then bind Vepachitti, the lord of the Asuras, and bring him before me in the assembly of the devas. Now, in that battle, the devas win, right? So the devas bind Vepachitti, the lord of the asuras, uh, by this fivefold bind, neck, hands, and feet, and brings him before Saka in the righteous assembly of the devas. So the Buddha continues, he says, So there was Vepachitti, the lord of the asuras, bound neck, hand, and foot. When the thought occurred to him, the devas in, are in the right, and the asuras in the wrong. So when this captured asura has the thought that they were in the right and actually the asuras in the wrong, I'm going. I'm now going over to the city of the devas. Then he viewed himself as freed from that fivefold bond. He was fully provided with the fivefold strings of heavenly sensuality. So Bhante Dhammajiva, who gives an amazing talk on, on this sutta, which I'll link to the video, uh, he, he he kind of explains this like, Vepachitti, he's there in this heaven that is so much, so much more beautiful, more sensuous than the, the realm he is used to, the Yasura realm. So when he uh, inclines towards that in his mind, when he, when he thinks about the devas in that way, his binds are removed. And he can fully enjoy that heavenly sensuality. But then the Sutta continues, but when the thought occurs to him, actually, no, the Asuras are in the right and the Devas are in the wrong. I will go back to the city of the Asuras. Then he viewed himself as bound with that fivefold bond, bond deprived of the fivefold five hold strings of heavenly sensuality. So then... Then, it, you know, if he if he thinks, actually, you know, as Bhante Dhammajiva says, what the hell am I doing? I'm the king of the asuras. I can't be going to the devas. When he thinks like that, the bonds, the, the handcuffs ap appear again. That's how subtle 
the bonds of Vepachitti were. But the bonds of Mara, the lord of death, the, the demon of defilement, of delusion. So Mara is this sort of character that you see in the in the Pali suttas. He's actually also a heavenly being, but his domain is the realm of sensuality, of, of the six senses, of, of samsara, this endless, completely endless cycle of birth, aging, death, rebirth, the whole mass of suffering. That is Mara's domain, right? So even more subtle than the bonds that are holding Vepachitti's uh, uh, his neck and his hands and his feet, the m bonds of Mara are even more subtle. Anyone who construes, another translation is supposes, anyone who supposes or construes, so with the mind, if we construe something or suppose something, let me quickly just get the definition of uh, construe on here. So construe is to interpret in a particular way, uh, to analyze. So anyone who interprets or supposes, you know, constructs something with the mind is bound by Mara. Anyone who doesn't construe, who does not suppose, is freed from the evil one. And then the Buddha describes in more detail what it means to construe. He says, to, to think I am is construing. I am this. I shall be. I shall not be. I shall be possessed of form. I shall not be possessed of form. I shall be percipient. I shall not be percipient. I shall neither perceive nor, nor not perceive. All of that is construing. Construing is a disease. Construing is a cancer. Construing, construing is an arrow. Therefore, monks, you should train yourselves. We will dwell with an awareness free of constraints. And then he goes on everything that he just talked about, the I am, I am this, I shall be. He calls that a, a perturbation, a, a concern, a disturbance. He calls it a wavering, an objectification, an act of conceit. And so he says, we should train ourselves. We will dwell with an awareness free of construings, free of perturbations, free of waverings, free of objectifications, free of acts of conceit. So when I, th when I think about this, it's, isn't this how it is for us? We are like Vepachitti. If we have the thought, oh, I'm I'm an I'm a failure, I'm defeated, then what happens? We are defeated. We are we are a failure. When if we have a thought of doubt, self-doubt, doubt of the Dhamma, then the Dhamma is close to us. We doubt ourselves. How many Buddhists out there? are doubting themselves, do not have faith about their own ability for Nibbana, for awakening, freedom. When you have that doubt, then that's true. You know, modern day kind of people talk a lot about this idea of manifestation. Um, in a way, this is, this is sort of a, in a similar realm here. When we, the, the mind is the master, mind is the maker, all phenomena are led by the mind, right? As the Buddha said in the first verse of the Dhammapada. So be very careful of how you look at things. Your way of looking completely decides the way the world appears, the way your life appears. Be very careful. If you think, oh, my, my wife is a, uh, you know, a B word or my husband is an ass, then 
then in that moment, that is that is the truth. You are bound by that thought. If you think my husband or wife is an angel, my home is a heaven, my home is a celestial realm, completely safe. I need I I need not want for anything. then that is true. Remember, Ajahn Sona defines metta as a feeling of relaxed safety. Metta is a loving kindness. He defines it as a feeling of relaxed safety, completely despite unrelated to whatever you're around, whatever your surroundings are. It's a feeling of relaxed safety. That's why when we bring metta to the heart, it's like a sphere of beauty, as Ajahn Suchito calls it. It's a sphere of beauty. Everything appears friendlier, warmer, more beautiful. So be very careful with the mind. It's extremely powerful. And you can see the sutta is very deep. To not construe is quite something, right? Um, to not feel that I am or I am not. The, the sense of self is very subtle. But as Bhante, Bhante Dhammajiva encourages, even a moment of mindfulness, it, when we're mindful, we can drop this I am. As, as Rob Berbea teaches, the sense of self is a spectrum. It's not just on or off it's a wide spectrum and you will feel as you as you become mindful even again for a moment that sense of self is lowered it's not there the way it was a moment ago you become like the beetle returned to the to the grass this whole mass of suffering all of it comes from these very subtle things that we do with the mind and lastly, I want to quickly mention a sutta that I feel is related. This is um, Mogharaja Manabhaputcha Sutta, Mogharaja's question. So Mogharaja is one of Bavari's 16 students. He's a Brahmin teacher who asks a question of the Buddha. And one of the Buddha's responses is, always mindful, regard the world as empty, having removed any view in terms of self. This way, one is above and beyond death. One who regards the world in this way isn't seen by death's king, which I believe is Mara. So again, always mindful, regard the world as empty. This world is empty. Empty of any inherent meaning, any inherent existence. There's nothing here to cling to, nothing here to fear or hope for, nothing here to desire or push away. We don't need to pull anything towards us or push anything away from us. Always mindful, regard the world as empty, having removed any view in terms of self. This way you are beyond, above and beyond death, and you cannot be seen by Mara. In the Udaya Manavaputcha Sutta, um, Udaya is another Brahmin student of Bhavari. The Buddha tells him, not relishing feeling inside or out. One living mindful in this way brings consciousness to a halt. So it's very interesting when you read these suttas, the Buddha will sort of combine mindfulness with these other aspects. Um, not relishing feeling inside or out. And you'll notice actually when you're mindful, this this already right mindfulness brings into motion these other things. When you're mindful, the world appears more empty than it did before. Just watch the next time you're totally perturbed and worried or frantic or angry. If you bring your awareness into the body in that moment, that previous thing will appear more empty. It will 
it will be less soli solid. You'll have more freedom to view it differently. And also when you're mindful, that relishing of feeling, that strong desire we have for pleasure, that will be reduced. And what comes from this mindfulness is this spiritual kind of pleasure. Pleasure that is not born of the senses, not born of thinking. A pleasure that um, it's, it's like drawing water from a well. We have this well within us completely full of water. And not just any water, this this mystical, beautiful, nourishing water, heavenly water. It's actually heavenly water. Not from the Deva realms, from the Brahma realms above. We can draw from that well. This pleasure that's out there in the world, it cannot compare to this spiritual pleasure, the pleasure of the jhanas, even the pleasure, the pleasure of mindfulness alone. Not even mentioning Nibbana. But the Dhamma Jiva talks about how we have mindfulness already. Even when we're not mindful, how do you know you're not mindful? It's because you're mindful. So even when there's unmindfulness, there is mindfulness of the unmindfulness. Otherwise, you wouldn't know that the mind was wandering. So when you take up this practice of mindfulness, don't get so, don't allow yourself to get worked up when the mind wanders. Don't worry about it. Notice how as soon as you're, you, you, you come back to the moment, you're already there. You're already home. I notice that when my mind wanders and then it comes back, it comes back and then after there's this, there can be this kind of voice in my head that, that says, oh, okay, it's back now. But even before it notices it's back, it's back. We are like the beetle, so close to the grass. So again, take this moment, this beautiful chance that you have right here, right now. As Bhante says, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? If not here, then where? Take this moment, invite the awareness to spread throughout the whole body. Feel your presence. Claim your birthright. Buddha Dhamma Sangha Namasami.